I want to start off with a Bible verse before anything happens. The Bible verse is Romans 11, 33. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. Imagine that you were given a moment to glimpse into the mind of God. Do you think you would understand what you see? Consider that living things came from the mind of God. Do you think we should understand biology? It should not be simple. I just expect it to be really complicated. You ever realize that the book of Job is a lawsuit? Job sued God. I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments, Job said. But then God appears in his own defense. And what does he do? He asks Job science questions. Do you know where the snow comes from? What about the rain? Can you put a hook in Leviathan's mouth? And when all that is done, what is Job's response? Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. If we were to look into the mind of God, the only rational response would be, I lay my hand on my mouth, even if you could talk. So we're going to now look into a small aspect of biology. Generally, when I give presentations, I like to make it easy. I like to take my audience, lead them by the hand, make sure we understand everything. You know, do you get this? Do you understand that? And then finally, here's a conclusion. I'm not going to do that this time. I want to try to open up as much of the mind of God as possible, which means we're not going to understand what we see, and it's okay. A lot of people are scared of biology because there's so many names and so many parts, and it just... You just memorize all this stuff, and then the next page is more stuff to memorize. But instead of being afraid of it, let's rejoice in it. And just hold on to your hats. Now, before I go any further, I need to introduce myself. My name is Robert Carter. I work for Creation Ministries International out of our U.S. offices near Atlanta. Uh, we have about, around the world, in our seven offices, about 30 speakers. And we visit probably 1,200, 1,300 churches, schools, couple universities um, around the world every year. We call ourselves an information ministry. We exist to answer people's questions. But tonight, I'm going to raise more questions than I answer on purpose. The point is, let's be humbled. We do produce a lot of things. We have um, this Creation Magazine, which has come out ooh, for 40-something years now. I remember getting Creation Magazine when I was in my, my uh, late teens. And I think this is one of the most significant things in my Christian walk. Because I think God let me study myself into Christianity as I answered my questions about evolution. Because I was an evolutionist when I first got exposed to these ideas. Things changed in my life, though. And, and Creation Ministry has been one of the giant blessings for me. And I can't believe I get to work for this organization now. We also have a gigantic website, creation.com. I know many of you are familiar with it. Some of you might not be. Um, we have well over 10,000 articles on our website on all sorts of different topics. We've been writing for over 40 years. So if you have a question when we're done, go to creation.com. Type something there in the search box and see if something pops up. And if something doesn't pop up that you like, send us an email. I spend about half of my time answering emails, and I've got several that have piled up over the last several days that I haven't gotten to that I have to answer probably tomorrow. The boss is going to say, Rob, you're a little bit late. So we are as on the spot as we can with these emails. We reply as fast as we can. And there's someone in our office who gets them Ah, oh, that's a good one for this person. They'll farm them out to one of our speakers who's an expert in whatever topic's being asked about. We also have an email service. Every Friday, we'll send out uh, a notice to all the people on our list. And it'll be something new, something informative, something exciting. It might be a new product. Very often, it'll be like some big evolutionary announcement that's supposed to challenge the Bible. Well, we'll, have, we'll commission a person to write an article, get it on our website, and by that Friday, it'll be on the list. In fact, I use this myself because... Even though I'm sitting in the office and I know we're building creation.com, I don't every day have an opportunity to read our front page article. But every Friday, I get a list of all the front page articles. Oh, I forgot to read that one. Click. So I get to actually keep up with my own information. 
That's there for you if you like it. While I'm speaking, we're going to be handing out a, a sign-up form. I know a lot of people in here already signed up. Thank you so much. But if you're interested, name, email address, and zip code. All right, they're going around now. Thank you, guys. And this is the title of my talk. The Spaghettification of Irreducible Complexity. I chose these two phrases on purpose, irreducible complexity and spaghettification. And I put them together on purpose. Now, most of you are probably familiar with Michael Behe and his um, intelligent design concept, the concept of irreducible complexity. Now, Michael Behe is a Catholic. He's not a young earth creationist like me, but this guy's awesome. He's really polite. I've met him several times. I've had conversations with him. He challenged me once in a, in a, um, a, a seminar, and he's the first person online to answer a question while my knees are knocking, and, and he's like, yep, I said, you were absolutely right. So something I'm going to say tonight was influenced by him. But he came up with this, I don't know if he came up with the concept, but he popularized this concept of irreducible complexity. That is, if you have any system that has a certain number of critical components, and if you remove or significantly change any of those components, that system no longer functions. It is irreducibly complex. Now, Andy McIntosh is coming in a couple months. Okay, he'll probably be talking about some biologically irreducibly complex systems. Maybe, maybe not. But here we have like the classic mousetrap illustration. There's only a few, more, few parts. You remove any of those parts, change them, it doesn't work anymore. That's irreducibly complex. Now, the spaghettification concept. In engineering, if something like is like working, all of a sudden it goes boom, 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 and it breaks into a billion pieces, it's been spaghettified. Another way to, to use that phrase is, if you have a system that you're trying to, to make work and you have to add a component, add another component, add another, 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 to do something like simple, like capture a mouse, but you need 20,000 parts, it's spaghettified. But I'm also using this on purpose because of something used to mock Christians, the flying spaghetti monster. This is just um, described in a satirical open letter written by a man named Bobby Henderson in 2005 to protest the Kansas Board of Education decision to allow the teaching of alternate theories, hence intelligent design, not necessarily young earth creationism, in the public school classroom. Around that time, in the early 2000s, there were several classic court cases in the U.S., all of which the Christian position lost. But he said in his letter, to believe in God, you might as well believe in the flying spaghetti monster. And that caught on. Now, of course, this is ridiculous because, one, no one believes in the flying spaghetti monster. Two, some, a random imaginary God is not an all-sufficient cause for the universe like the God of the Bible is. But I'm using this, the spaghettification concept on purpose, hints at that, and now let's look and see what happens. Now I'm going to ask a simple question. How does a cell make a single protein? That is not simple to answer. First of all, some background. In your cell, to make a protein, you have DNA. DNA carries genes. The DNA is first turned into RNA, two very similar chemicals. DNA has four letters, A, C, G, and T. RNA has four letters, A, C, G, and U. They're very similar, but slightly different. The process of, of creating RNA from DNA is called transcription. But the RNA then is turned into protein. Proteins have 21 letters. And then those letters are modified after the fact, but basic proteins, 20, including selenocysteine, by the way, People who had biology decades ago don't know there's a 21st amino acid. Selenocysteine is the 21st. But the process of going from RNA to protein is called translation. I'm going to say this a lot. Transcription, translation, protein. This is also the, um, the, one of the most fundamental ideas in evolutionary biology. This is called the, uh, the central dogma of molecular biology that information only flows from DNA to RNA to protein and never back. Now that is false. I did a YouTube video on that. The barrier has been destroyed. There is 
recursive information going the other way to rewrite DNA. Not supposed to be true, but it is. That's another story for another day. But just remember, DNA goes to RNA through transcription, RNA goes to protein through translation. You okay with that? Now, if you had high school biology after about 1960, you would have learned that, if you remember it. <laughs> if you had high school biology last week, you're supposed to remember this. Hopefully, you passed your test. Okay, so let's make a random protein. I'm just gonna pick a particular protein. One of the proteins in the ATP synthase motor. This is something that just happens to be critical to all life forms on Earth. All known life forms use a molecule called adenosine triphosphate, which is just pictured there in the top left. It's a very sensitive molecule. It's a highly reactive molecule. It's not found in nature only found in living cells. What happens is we have this rotary motor that takes adenosine diphosphate, shown in light blue, and joins it to a phosphate. Now, that's weird because phosphate is really hard to find in nature. Phosphate, I mean, one of the problems with um, like pollution in Lake Erie is when the farmer is putting phosphates in the field to wash into Lake Erie and you get an algae bloom. Because phosphate is really, it, it, any time a phosphate touches a metal ion, it forms an insoluble salt and precipitates out a solution. And biological organisms can't break that. Now some bacteria can, but it depends on the action of a, a very specific biological reaction to free that phosphate. You think about, biological things have a lot of phosphate in them. DNA is a phosphate backbone, RNA is a phosphate backbone. And we use ATP, which is three phosphates. So we take this adenosine diphosphate, which is a highly reactive molecule and is not found in nature, and join it to a phosphate, which is another highly reactive molecule that's not generally found in nature, to make adenosine triphosphate. Your body makes its own weight of ATP every day. And it comes from burning sugars. So your mitochondria, the sugar goes in the mitochondria, it, it consumes the sugar, produces carbon dioxide, and ATP, and ATP is used to power almost every cellular reaction in your body. Literally just about everything is controlled by ATP. Okay? Let's make one of those proteins. But looking at that motor, I'm gonna shout with the psalmist, Psalm 92.4. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. Biologists should be constantly praising God. When we look at something like that, it's the world's smallest motor. But it's not powered by electrons, it's powered by proteins, and it works at almost 100% efficiency. What a crazy, but let's make this. Let's make just one part of it. First of all, in order to have the gene for that protein, you need DNA. But DNA itself is a highly reactive molecule. The DNA in our cells must be maintained or the gene will disintegrate. But DNA maintenance uses up a lot of ATP. Wait a minute. So to have the gene that makes it the protein for the ATP synthase motor that makes the ATP, you need DNA repair systems that require a lot of ATP. So in the origin of life scenario, what came first? Because you need DNA maintenance systems or you don't get life. They must be there at incipient life or you're not gonna use DNA because it breaks down too quickly. How quick is quick? Five seconds or five hours or five years? DNA in free solution when it's being attacked by oxygen and water uh, will break down with a half-life of days. Um, the longest DNA, um, the, the best estimates of DNA, I don't remember the exact half-life but they used MOA bones, MOA bones in um, New Zealand and carbonated them and said, oh, they're this old. They looked at it and here's how long the DNA pieces are and they estimated the half-life was in like 1,000 years, 2,000 years or something. I don't remember the exact number. But it was not millions, it was not even hundreds of thousands of years. Um, they also did different temperature things. But the problem is we have good reasons to believe that carbon dating, the closer you get to the flood, gets artificially old, amplified. So their dates are too old, their rate is too slow. You get it down to the real rate and it's much faster than the evolution want to admit, but even then it's still too fast for them. Great question. So looking at DNA, there is 
a backbone. There's my molecule spinning over there. It's a double helix. You'll notice that the two things don't actually touch. They're held together by hydrogen bonds, not covalent bonds. There's two strings that wrap around each other. They're like rungs in a ladder. Those are your ACs, Gs, and Ts. And A is always opposite T, because it has two bonds. And C is always opposite G, because it has three bonds, hydrogen bonds. This is the basic uh, rung right there. There's three phosphates, that two of them are cleaved off. That pho the remaining phosphate runs down, linking sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate. The sugar is a five, in yellow there, it's a five carbon sugar called a pentose. Ribose is a five carbon sugar. So deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, or ribonucleic acid, RNA. They just have different, different pentoses. And then in blue there, that's where the base goes. Let me turn on my laser pointer, I can do better here. In blue, that's where the base goes. And the bases are either one of the purines or one of the pyrimidines. You understand this yet? Yeah. Going into your head, you got it, you got it? Yeah. This, is, this is elementary compared to what's coming. But that's the basic structure of DNA. The problem is DNA in solution has issues, lots of issues perhaps one million times a day in every single one of your cells. DNA is attacked by oxygen or water or it's pulled until it snaps. One million DNA lesions per day must be fixed or you would die very soon. The DNA repair systems are intrinsic to your survival. No organism can be based on DNA without DNA repair systems. So it's a chicken egg problem. What came first, the DNA or the DNA repair systems? The DNA or the code for the DNA repair systems that's in the DNA itself. That's kind of vicious, isn't it? It's like a three-way chicken and egg problem. Is what we saw computer generated or real uh, What you saw is generated by a CMI staff artist using molecular modeling programs. Um, we can take pictures of DNA using scanning tunneling microscopes. You put it on a very cold plate and use a, a, a very fine gem and you can scan it over um, atoms and molecules. Um, you can see that that's the limit though. We can't actually visualize it with a light microscope. So DNA damage repair. If one of the letters is chemically modified by water, oxygen, or something like that, it's now it's a new letter. So there are suites of proteins which are coded in the DNA, which have to be transcribed and then translated, which uses a lot of ATP. That will come in and say, oh, that chemical modification, I can fix it but there are different repair systems for different chemical modifications. There are different repair systems for single strand breaks, different repair systems for double strand breaks, different repair systems that get rid of knots and tangles. It's really complicated. And without that, you don't get DNA. But not only that, DNA has to be replicated. And the DNA replication system is incredibly complicated and it requires a lot of proteins. Of course, the proteins coded in the DNA had to be transcribed and then translated, and that uses a lot of ATP. We're talking about topoisomerases that undo knotting, a helicases that open up the strand, single strand binding proteins that keep it open. Then you have two different DNA polymerases. One goes in one direction, one goes in the other direction. There's DNA primase. Um, you have DNA ligase, and the RNA is working in there. That all has to be in place before we even get the, I'm asking what it takes to sit, take it, make a single protein. You need all these proteins to make that protein. But without that protein, you can't make these proteins. So are we looking at a single DNA going in from the right and two coming out from the left? This is a single DNA double helix here. It's being opened up and then copied. This, RNA, this DNA polymerase is just zipping down it this way, and that one is working this way and fits and starts, and then it has to be joined together. That is a eukaryotic DNA replication fork. Prokaryotes have a different form with different proteins. Hebrews 11.3. 
By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. That sounds like he's saying naturalism's not true. Nature didn't produce what we see. The physical phenomena we see did not produce life. No, life had to be produced by a highly intelligent being or life would not exist. Complex things don't come from random chemistry. All right, let's move on to the next step. Now that we have DNA, we can maintain it, we can duplicate it. Let's find our gene, which I'll skip over that part. Once we find the gene, let's just transcribe it into RNA. And we're gonna use this simple molecule. <laughs> RNA polymerase. So here we have, zipping down our DNA strand, right there, oh, there goes our polymerase. Now we are way oversimplifying this. Look, the nucleotides are just randomly floating in. No, it's much more complicated than that. The strand is opened up. We're not even showing how that happens. The letters A, C, G, and U are matched up to the letters in one strand of the DNA, and they pop out the other side as an RNA. Guess how much ATP that uses? A lot. Every single step, every single letter, every single increment of that machine down the DNA, opening it up, closing it back, that all uses ATP. And by the way, the letters themselves are also made of ATP. The A in DNA, A, C, G, and T, the adenine, well, that adenosine triphosphate. When you stick it on the base and you have those three phosphates, that's ATP. Cleave off two of the phosphates, that's the A that's used in DNA and RNA. So in order to have DNA, you need ATP so you can have the A in the DNA strand. Oh, and the, the, there's also a GTP, which requires ATP to make through a very complex chemical process, which uses proteins that are coded in the, pro, in the DNA that are transcribed and translated that also uses ATP. And there's a CTP, a UTP, and a TTP, just for fun. But to get the RNA, we have to deal with something, at least not in bacteria. In bacteria, their genes are very simple. There's a start, there's a protein coding gene, and there's a stop. But anything more complicated than the bacteria, like people, we have these things in the middle of our genes. They're called introns. I'm showing them here in blue. Intron, intron, intron. The protein coding region is just in red. So when this is made into RNA, the blue parts have to be cut out and the red parts have to be joined together. Now sometimes those blue parts are actually entire genes. So you make one transcript, cut out the blue, you get one gene, join the parts together, you get another gene. They're not even related to each other. But once you get the red, which is the exons joined together, your DNA translating apparatus can grab onto what's called the five primed UTR. The UTR means untranslated region. Just that end of the gene, that's where all the control that says make it or don't make it. Sometimes the cell makes an RNA and just caps it so it can't turn into a protein right away, but the RNA is there and ready to go. So when a cell needs to make the protein, the RNA is already present. Up, oh, turn it on, now we can make the protein. There's a lot of things happening, but not only that, at the junction between the introns and the exons, there's usually 12, 15, up to 19 little signals five, six letters long that tell the cell where to cut and when to cut. Because different cells in your body will make different proteins. In fact, you make like 300,000 proteins, but you only have about 23,000 protein coding genes. And different cell types make different versions of similar proteins because they have different exons in them. Sometimes the intron can be used as an exon. Sometimes I'll take an exon from a totally different place in the genome and stick it into a protein as it's being manufactured. So what I'm talking about is, first of all, intron splicing, the simple version, take exons, get rid of the introns, join them together, run them through the translation apparatus and you can get a protein. But most proteins are alternately spliced. So the gene that we want, sorry, the protein that we want for ATP synthase motor 
the parts of that protein coding gene might be stuck in different genes in different places in the genome. They had to be found, they had to be located, they had to be spliced together. And guess what? That takes a lot of ATP. So you can, starting, starting from the same DNA, the same RNA, depending on which of the exons you use, you can get very different proteins. Sometimes the proteins have nothing to do with one another, totally different functions. Sometimes there's just similar versions of a protein that maybe your eyeball and your liver make a similar protein, but it's not exactly the same. You confused yet? Psalm 138, 14, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. When was the last time you said that in the middle of biology class? <laughs> Let's move on. There's another thing that we need to deal with, and that is epigenetics. You have a bunch of genes, but then on top of that, epi means above or upon in Greek, you have a lot of things that turn genes on and turn genes off depending upon conditions. Think, when you're growing as an adolescent, you don't need the hormones that you have during puberty and adulthood. Something flips a switch and lots of genes start working that weren't working before. You don't need the same genes when you're a single cell in your mother than you do when you're 50 years old. Your genes turn on, genes turn off. A lot of genes, they upregulate and downregulate. The difference between men and women is not our gene count, it's the radical difference in gene expression levels of thousands of genes. This is why just taking puberty blockers doesn't change your sex or your gender, whatever you want to call it. It's not true. It's not possibly true. In fact, men, boys, males, are dosed with testosterone in utero. There's simply different testosterone levels. That's why when a baby's born, boys and girls look different. The main thing that drives that is hormone levels. The Y chromosome doesn't say build testes and a penis. No, it says regulate hormone levels, and the hormone levels do all those changings. By the way, um, I'm getting off topic here. Boys and girls are always different. There was never a time when the embryo was female. That is an urban myth. There is a time when you can't tell because a single cell or a ball of cells. And it's one point at which basically the, the part between the legs starts folding over and it pokes in or pokes out. That's where you get your male-female difference. But there's always a genetic difference and there's always a hormonal difference. Epigenetics. Epigenetics deals with putting tags on the DNA like um, the D, the, your cell can stick a single carbon with a couple hydrogens on it, it's called a methyl group, on the DNA. That will tell the cell, this gene is off. Sometimes it might interfere with the DNA polymerase sliding down the DNA because there's a thing that, there that makes it stuck. There's some different viewpoints on that. Also, your DNA wraps around proteins, they're called histones. And histones have a tail. And the tail has epigenetic factors. Sometimes 15 or 20 chemical modifications happen to that protein. And that tells the cell what to do with this stretch of DNA. And different cell types will modify their histones differently. Oh, this is fascinating. This is all regulated by proteins and RNA, which require transcription for the RNA, which requires ATP, and then translation for the proteins, which requires ATP. And those genes also have to be coded into DNA. The maintenance of the DNA requires a lot of ATP. Next, translation. Let's finally take our, let's, let's finally make our protein. What's it gonna take? Well, we're gonna take our messenger RNA, and we're gonna use these little things. They're called transfer RNAs. On the bottom of the transfer RNA, there's a three little code. And it's gonna match up to the RNA, three letters at a time. We're gonna run through this very complex machine called a ribosome. It's made of RNAs and proteins, which have to be maintained in the DNA, then transcribed, then translated, using a lot of ATP. Now, as it's going, the transfer RNAs will, the amino acids on the top will pop off and join a growing protein strand. 
But the amino acids have to be added to the transfer RNA. Guess what? That takes ATP, an entire another suite of, of, um, of proteins, one particular protein, a lot of helper proteins, which are in the DNA, have to be maintained, have to be transcribed and translated. All that requires a lot of ATP. And if this machine makes a mistake, sometimes it can back up and fix it. But it's worse than that. Because those transfer RNAs would not work. If you just took that gene, made it into an RNA, let it fold to a tRNA, it would not function. They require dozens of chemical modifications. The three-letter code at the bottom, it's not strong enough to bond to the DNA temporarily, so it's chemically modified so that it does. The ends, sorry, this is a, an excellent paper by Royal Truman, a journal of creation. He's done a whole series of these. I learned so much. But the, the two ends at the top, one of them is chopped off. One of them has to have something added to it. There's literally dozens of chemical modifications on each one of these in different places that change the chemistry. And all those chemical modifications are modulated by proteins. Dozens of proteins in the DNA that must be maintained, that must be transcribed and translated using the things that they modify themselves. So you can't get the transfer RNA to work until you have the transfer RNA modification gene, but you can't have the transfer modification gene until the transfer RNA works. There's chicken and egg problems everywhere here. Just, just a, li a list of some of the chemical modifications that happens to these things. I'll just leave it at that. Now, we finally have our protein. You saw that red strand being made. Did you notice those yellow things grabbing onto it? Well, yeah, not so fast because most proteins need help folding. So these chaperones, these are proteins maintained in the DNA transcribed, translated, using modified tRNAs, they don't let the protein fold. They will escort this unfolded protein to a, a watermelon-shaped molecule. It's called a chaperonin. It's this giant, multi-protein structure. We don't quite know how it works yet. By the way, everything I'm showing you is Nobel Prizes and PhD dissertations and millions of dollars of research. Well, this thing, we know, it closes up it folds the protein. If the protein folds incorrectly, I don't know how it knows that, it will chop it up into pieces. And then out the other side pops our protein. And we can't use it yet. Because most proteins are chemically modified by other proteins. Which are maintained in the DNA, transcribed, alternately spliced, translated, and then modified by themselves, which requires a lot of ATP. In fact, the classic example is one of the first proteins ever sequenced, insulin. Insulin is a simple little protein. It just looks like that. But after it's made, other proteins come up and snip it and we have chemical reactions that happen internally. So the final insulin is actually two separate protein strands that are held together by um, covalent bonds between sulfur residues and amino acids. That looks like nothing like the primary transcript or the primary protein strand. Most proteins, probably including the one in our ATP synthase motor, has to be modified after they're manufactured or they don't work. And finally, we have to get the protein to where it needs to be. So if you have a cell, there's a cell nucleus. Inside the nucleus, that's where transcription happens. The RNA has to be brought outside of the nucleus, goes through a pore. Then that's where translation happens. But now we have our protein, we have to get it into the mitochondria. The mitochondria has a double membrane. And I think the ATP synthase enzymes are inside. Maybe it might have to go through three membranes. I forget. I should know this. It's just, you know, there's so much stuff in my head at the moment. I'm getting confused. So let's get it there. First, we have to build a protein highway of millions of protein subunits. Guess what? Maintained in the DNA, transcribed, and translated. The assembly requires ATP. And then we have 
this unbelievable molecule. It literally walks. One ATP per step. Millions of steps per millimeter. And the blob thing it's carrying is, is a, a membrane-bound vesicle with tags on it, which works as like a post office. It tells the thing where to go. Consider this. In my toes, I have nerves. The nerves have neurotransmitters. The neurotransmitters have to be brought to my toe with one of those. The neurotransmitters are produced in the cell nucleus in the small of my back. It might take two months for them to walk down my leg to my toe. So if I go, ouch, and I stub my toe, I can know it. This is crazy complicated. So something like that has to bring our protein to the mitochondria. If the cell was depending upon random diffusion, just a random wiggledy walk of our protein through the cell to get to where it's going, we'd be dead. I'm kind of guessing though, the inside of the cell is hardly random at all. That not even water molecules are free. Such that when you have all your scaffolding and your proteins and your, your clusters of things in the cell, they're like highways of chemistry. So the cell's like, I just made this thing, and you can zip to right to where it's going. Because we see things moving in the cell much faster than they can possibly move, and we don't know how they get there. I bet it's because when God programmed the cell, he knew all the chemistry of all the little atoms in there, and he puts them in just the right place so that things get to their proper place very quickly. I don't know that, that's a prediction. But this is crazy. So in the end, here's what we have. We've got our little motor right there. One of these proteins is going to be the thing that we created. So it's going to make ATP. That ATP is going to fold, is going to, not fold, it's going to power DNA synthesis, the creation of all of the proteins required for that, DNA repair systems, it's going to power the alternate splicing of the RNAs and the transcription of the RNA. It's going to power the creation of the transfer RNAs through transcription, their chemical modification by proteins, which have to go all through this process first, to get to RNA. It's going to power translation and then protein folding and the modification, post-folding modification of the proteins before we get it. But at the same time, you have to modify all your transfer RNAs or else this whole transcription process doesn't work and translation process doesn't work. So you need DNA polymerases, helicases, DNA primases, DNA ligases, topoisomerases, exonucleases, RNA primases, transcription factors, splicing factors, endonucleases, chaperones, chaperonins, many different proteins for the modification enzymes, many different proteins for the transfer RNA modification. Before we can get the thing that all those things depend upon. Irreducible complexity of a mouse trap? When you look at real biology, irreducible complexity spaghettifies. Now, if you didn't understand that, good. This is barely able to be put into a human's head. And that was just a sketch. You could spend your life studying any one of those processes. You can get your PhD in one protein and know everything about that protein. And you will learn that that protein is really complicated and depends upon a lot of other things and uses up a lot of ATP. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 26 through 31. For consider your calling, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. What other choice do we have? when faced with something like that.
like Job, all I can say is, I lay my hand on my mouth. Because when I look at biology, I am humbled. It is incredible. And it would, after all that, I hope you can see, it could never have evolved. The way I imagine this is God, like a, like a kid with a wind-up mouse, but God does this like infinitely more complicated. He takes the ATPs, he takes all the proteins, he takes all the, the nucleotides, the DNA, the cell membrane, the mitochondria. He puts ATP here, here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here. He takes these proteins and puts them all in the right spot. He gets it all wound up and he goes, and there's a living thing. It is a non-trivial process. Again, I would love for you to sign up for Creation Magazine. They're out there in the back. I have a lot of other books there also. Uh, for a one-year subscription, you'll start your magazine subscription today. For a two-year subscription, I will also throw in the digital version of our magazine, which we want you to share with other people, and our monthly newsletters, and two DVDs. One of them is called Fallout. We took a TV camera to college campuses around Atlanta and interviewed students, and we asked them three questions. Did you go to church growing up? Were you ever taught anything about creation and evolution? And do you still go to church? And man, those are good conversations. We captured them, little mini documentaries, kind of quirky, 35 minutes long, powerful. I'm also going to throw in Darwin, The Voyage That Shook the World. It's our um, National Geographic style documentary on the life of Charles Darwin. You need to know that man if you're going to understand evolution. And he's not the man most people think. Here's what a sign-up form looks like. It's going to be going around as we're, as we're wrapping up. Um, just check off one or two years if you're interested. And I know a lot of people in here already get it. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And then just add your address. Okay, after that, I have an entire box of Creation, Mag uh, Creation Answers books under the table out there. I don't want to ship them home tomorrow. UPS is expensive. But they're there. They're $15, and that's going to answer 99% of the questions you might have. We wrote that exactly to answer 99% of the questions we get. So the questions you're going to ask me in a little bit, I bet they're all in there already. We also have a pack. The starter pack comes with the Creation Answers book, the best-selling Creation Evolution book ever written, Refuting Evolution, and a random DVD. Here's Evolution's Achilles Heels, the book and the documentary. I'm very proud of this. Um, I believe the last copy of Evolution's Achilles Heels got sold just earlier. But if you'd like to get a copy, ask Ken to take a look at his book and then buy it from me and I'll ship it from you from Atlanta without our, our $5 shipping cart charge. I'll ship it to you for free if you want to get here tonight. We still have some copies of that documentary there. Biblical Geology 101. It's all about rocks and minerals and fossils and what you need to know to just have a basic understanding of geology. Not high-level stuff, entry-level stuff, and how it relates to Noah's flood. The Deep Time Deception talks about how old the Earth is, radiometric dating, why, we think, why some people think the Earth is millions of years old, why we don't. Great book. How Noah's flood shaped the Earth is about the shape of the Earth. Like, it talks about the Ice Age, which severely affected this landscape around here. We have some kids' books. We have multi-part DVD series on the book of Genesis. I was really trying to get to this. Jeremiah 10, 12. It is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom, and by his understanding stretches out the heavens. Now that's Old Testament. Who is he? Well, in the New Testament, quite clearly, he is Jesus Christ. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. Without Him, not anything was made that was made. Of course, God is not made because God is outside time, right? But everything else has to be made. Well, who is this Word? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ is the creator of the universe. When I said earlier that I'm giving you an illustration of God adding all these things and winding it up, and adding, that was Jesus doing that. Your creator is Jesus Christ. Your creator came down to this earth and lived as a human and then died in your place to pay for your sins so that you can stand righteously before the holy God. And that Jesus made all that crazy stuff that we just saw. All that should do is make us do this.
And if you're going to say anything at all, praise God. Thank you much.